from Mark Father, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. He joins us from Hong Kong this morning. Mark, welcome to the trade. A three-year lifeline for Greece. What do you think, Mark? I mean, the best case scenario, but the best case outcome for Greece and the rest of Europe, you think? Well, I think basically it's another process of monetization. We have now synchronized monetization in the world. And what it means is essentially the euro will remain weak and there'll be more bailouts. And for Greece, this means terrific austerity and the terrific recession. Now, the problem with a recession in Greece, if you de diminish the budget deficit from 13% of GDP to 3%, is that as the economy shrinks, the ability of Greece to pay its interest will also diminish. And so they may default sooner or later anyway. But in the meantime, certainly that isn't optimistic or fair, favorable for the euro, but it's of course favorable for resources. I'd like to add about resources, the tax that Australia is introducing is negative for the companies that produce resources, but it's positive for the commodities because it will contain the supply. Uh, Mark, you said that there could be more bailouts from now on. Are you then saying the risk of a Greek contagion has not been eliminated? I can tell you all governments will eventually have to be bailed out in the Western world. It's either going to be through money printing, as I think, or default. But they are over-indebted, especially if you consider the unfunded liabilities that arise from future pensions, from Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and so forth. It doesn't add up. They'll all default or they'll all print money. But the outcome won't be pretty, that I assure you. It won't be pretty. You've said before, you've said before that it is time to kick Greece out of the EU. Do you still hold that view? Is it too late to do that? Well, basically, the best is to swallow the hard medicine and let, when you have a financial problem, to let companies that are weak go bankrupt. And the same in the world, if you have weak governments, you have to look at Greece like a corporation. There's no way that Greece can pay its debt. It's over-indebted. The debt has to be restructured and not just shifted to the EU. So the best would have been essentially to leave the EU and default. But of course, that is unacceptable for many governments because the banks have lent so much money to Greece already. Mark, in 30 seconds, how about the cost of the Greek debacle and global growth? Is there a chance the momentum in the global economic recovery may be slowed or derailed? I don't think that Greece will have any impact, but basically the sovereign debt problems will have an impact. The over-leveraged consumer will have an impact. And what will also have an impact is now the uh, lessened impact of the stimulus package in the United States. And then we have the markets that are telling you that something is not quite right because a lot of commodities, okay. industrial commodities, have been coming down. Uh, Mark, do you still think China faces danger signals from credit expansion and surging real estate prices? Have measures to curb surging uh, growth worked at all? Well, I think the signals are all there. The symptoms of a major bubble are all there. And I'd like you to remind you and your viewers of the following. Ahead of the 1873 World Exhibition in Vienna, there was a lot of hype about this World Exhibition at the time. And there was a huge property boom in Vienna, Austria, and Prussia. And then about six months ago, Ahead of the opening of the World Exhibition, the stock market started to tank. And what followed thereafter is the Great Depression of the 1870s that lasted until 1885 and was like the Great Depression of the 1930s, a devastating deflationary bust. So I think the opening of the Expo in Shanghai <laughs> is not a particularly good omen.
<laughs> Quite a scary thought there. Let's take a look at the Shanghai Composite Index. So, what, trading at 22 times earnings compared with 17 times for the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. Uh, looks like China is still not looking very cheap at this point in time. Your thoughts on that? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh, what are you making of valuations in China? Well, basically, I think that stocks, by and large, are kind of fully priced. Now, I'd like to make uh, one point is, if China contains speculation in properties, the money could flow actually into the stock market. But the stock market technically doesn't look good because it peaked out already in July 2009. And since then, it's been in a downtrend. Then it made another high in November 2009. But that high was below the peak in July 2009. And now we're down. The same, the Hang Seng Index hasn't made a new high above the November 2009 high. So I think the market is telling you that something is not quite right. Then you look at industrial commodity prices and you look at industrial sensitive countries and the currencies, whether it's Australia or equities like Freeport, PHP, Rio Tinto, they all act heavy. So I think that the Chinese economy is going to slow down regardless. It is more likely that we will even have a crash sometimes in the next nine to 12 months. So what should we do, stay away from China? Well, that uh, every investor has his own agenda and his own investment objective. Maybe if you want to speculate, you can maybe speculate on a rebound. I wouldn't do that. I would rather stay okay. away. Mark, Kong. Mark, what do you make of uh, all the talk about Yuan revaluation? When do you see that happening? Well, I mean, nobody knows for sure. I think over time, the Chinese currency will obviously appreciate against the US dollar. But you have to understand, in today's world, all paper currencies are not particularly desirable. All governments will print money. All governments will have fiscal stimulus packages as soon as something goes wrong. And all paper currencies will lose in their purchasing power. So there's only one ultimate currency and these are precious metals specifically gold and we were talking before about if chinese can't speculate anymore in properties what will they shift their funds into if they still have any that is another question then i would think that maybe they'll become big buyers of gold uh, you talk about gold what assumptions are you making about where gold prices are headed well, I have modest assumptions. I just think it will go up against paper currencies or paper currencies will go down against gold. I don't know how far it will go. For that, you better call Mr. Bernanke and you ask him how much <laughs> money he will print because he will print and print and print. It's only a matter of the quantity he will print. Mark, the dollar, pretty resilient, pretty much thanks to the euro weakness. And despite all the money printing in the U.S., what's really going on with the USD? Well, basically, what happened is the U.S. dollar became very oversold last November when the euro went to 151. And the euro at that time was overpriced. And since then, the euro has weakened very considerably, as you know, today towards 133. I think that this is about fair value vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar, but I think the euro will continue to drift lower because markets are that way. They overshoot and then they undershoot. And so I think for a while, the dollar may still rise somewhat. So the euro had it lower. Do you think it's a doomed currency? I don't think, well, I think all currencies are doomed. As I told you, I only <laughs> think there's one currency that will keep its value, and these are precious metals. Uh, so apart from gold, what are you liking? Silver, aluminum? Well, basically, the commodities that are relating to Chinese growth, in other words, the industrial commodities, copper, nickel, zinc, and so forth, 
I would avoid for the time being. I would also avoid companies that are exposed to Chinese economic growth. But the commodities that come out the best at the present time, technically, are the agricultural commodities, wheat, corn, soybeans. Uh, I think they're in the process of making major lows. Now, it's not easy for an individual to play a rising agricultural commodity cycle, but these are the commodities that look attractive. Mark, before we let you go, we, I want to take a look at Thailand, a market you've been following a very long time. What do you make of all, uh, well, the bloodshed, the, the discontent, the protests that we've been seeing in the last few weeks? Well, basically, I think that I have sympathy for the so-called red shirts, the followers of Thaksin. Uh, I don't have sympathy for Mr. Thaksin, but I think the followers, they have a point we have a great disparity in, the, in Thai society between the so-called Bangkok aristocracy, the royalty, and the rural population. And I think the rural population feels that they have been at a disadvantage and didn't participate in the economic growth of the country. So I think they have a point. At the same time, obviously, 75% of Thai GDP is in the Bangkok region, and so the Bangkok region economically is essentially the center of the country. And I think the differences will be very difficult to reconcile. Now, having said that, the stock market actually this year is still up, and it didn't go down all that much so far. Now, I think it will go lower, but in Thailand, you can buy lots of companies that are not cyclical, that have a dividend right. yield of, say, 5 to 6%. So the market is the cheapest market in Asia. Okay, Mark Faber, publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. Thank you so much for being on the trade today. And we have